this started. We've had our keyboardist here, Ashley, and he was just worshiping the Lord on the keyboards. And uh, for those of you that have been here, you would know that the Spirit of God is already here, receiving the worship. And uh, oh, I just, I just feel so comfortable in this place, so at peace in His presence. And you know something, we might think to ourselves that we have done certain things in our lives to create an atmosphere for the presence of God, and that, that, that does have a, a point. But you would soon learn that it is His Spirit who initiates everything in our walk. So it is He who teaches us how to create an atmosphere for Him. He says, he, he shows us what he's comfortable with, what he wants, what he likes, what he doesn't like. So I just believe that this morning he, he just led us today. He set the atmosphere for us. He walked into this room, into this beautiful hall, sat down. He put the melodies, the harmonies in, in his spirit, in his mind. And he, as he began to play, he's just here. So, Lord, we just bless you. Lord, we thank you for showing up here today, Lord. Because, Lord God, in many houses, Lord, people show up, Lord, but you don't. And so we thank you that you are here. We thank you with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our souls, with all our beings, Lord. Thank you that you are here, Lord. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Oh, we just thank you, Lord, that you have a dwelling place, Lord, that we can come here every week, every day to dwell in your presence, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
And Lord, you are that most precious anointing.
You may be seated. Turn with me, please, to the book of Matthew, chapter 9. And we all know the title of the message today because I've been promising this message for weeks now. New wineskins for new wine. There seems to be anticipation for this message. And that's a good thing. So we have two verses 16 and 17. Jesus is speaking here. He says, No man put a piece of new cloth onto an old garment. For that which is put in it, fill it up, take it from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine in new bottles, and both are preserved. You say, then why would you call it wineskins and not bottles? Because in those days, they didn't have glass bottles like we have today. They had skins. They made pouches with skins, and they put the wine or the water in those wine skins bottles. You might have seen it in Western movies. When the cowboys get very thirsty, and they drink all the water from the wineskin bottles, they would wring it to get every drop to quench their thirst. So that was bottles. All right? God starts with the new. He always starts with the new. For instance, when man sinned, God didn't do a patchwork 
to fix man. He made a new man. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says it. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature, a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become, have become new. A new creation. And it will be followed by a new heaven and a new earth. God is going to provide sometime in the future a new heaven and a new earth. We can find this in Isaiah 65, 17 and Revelation 21, 1. To the doubters, you can find what I just said in those scriptures. By the new birth, the Christian has already undergone the fundamental change. He is a new creature of, of the sorts of that belongs to the new creation. The problem is that the new man, the new creation, choose the way of the old man. That's the problem. That's the number one problem with Christians and the church and Christianity. They're supposed to be new creations. But we love the old creation. We love the old man and we've refused to give up that old man for the new man. The day the church gets this knowledge and this revelation and starts to live in the new creation, this new man, the world will change. And I want that to resound throughout wherever this message is going. God is not a loser. So he has to do something. He has to do something. Because he's not a loser. And we're going to discover today what God has to do in this message. The work of God always, and I stress always, moves forward in a straight path and never turns back. If God were to turn back, he would cease to be God. You see, turning back denotes uncertainty, to be unsure, having second thoughts. And could you imagine God having second thoughts? Could you imagine God being unsure and uncertain of what he said will happen and how it will happen? That wouldn't be God. That cannot be God. Turning back also means aborting the cause or the pursuit. It denotes abandonment. God never abandons a thought. He never abandons a decision. He never abandons a directive. So all the new things you see going into the word of God, no, it, it's not God. It's that easy, it's that simple. Because God cannot alter his word. He cannot change his nature, his character. He cannot do 
other than who he is. If we can settle this simple, simple fact, it will help us to stay on course on the narrow way. But when we don't understand that about God, we see that there's a broad way over there and everybody is going the broad way, so we must get on the broad way as well. Except Austin DeBoog. <laughs> I have stayed on the narrow way from the day I started to the present and will continue on that narrow way. Even if you leave, that's okay. God will send others. Because he, 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 he has to save some, right? Okay. This is why God is never in favor of those who, having put their hands to the plow, turn back. Now you understand why turning back is not a good idea. Because God never turns back. And he doesn't want us, having put our hands to the plow, to turn back. It's a serious thing. Why is it so serious? Because God said, said those who turn back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. I think that's serious. He said, those who turn back, having put your hand to the plow, is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. That is serious business, like Reverend George will say. Whenever we are talking about issues, he will always add, that's serious business. <laughs> and so this is serious business. How many of you have put your hands to the plow and turn back and think it's okay. You promise God you will teach Sunday school, to teach the children in Sunday school. Now they've all abandoned the commitment to teach Sunday school, etc., and etc., and etc. Put your name in the etc. Because many of you have turned back from the things you promised God to do for the kingdom of God. Jesus says, if you are thinking of turning back, remember Lot's wife. God warned Lot and his family not to look back. But Lot's wife looked back. And you know what the Bible says about her. She turned into a pillar of salt. This is my second trip to Israel driving through Gomorrah right opposite the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is in that area of Gomorrah and it's only salt. Mountains of, only, of pure salt. And the bus driver says to us, Look carefully at that particular place. And you're looking carefully, and he says, don't you see her? <laughs> and really, you see eyes, and you see nose, and you see an a image, 
of a, of, a, of, a, of a person. Maybe he was joking, I don't know. <laughs> but it sure looked like her. <laughs> so those of you who decide to having put your hand to the plow, turn back. Jesus says, remember Lot's wife, because this is apparently serious with God. Because God himself never turns back. A certain thing happened recently. Recently. The effects of it is still with us. And many Christians have gone back because of this thing. They have abandoned Christ. They have abandoned their Christian faith. And when they meet you, they will voluntarily tell you they are not backslidden. They just want you to know, you haven't seen me. I'm not there, but I'm not backslidden. They might be Mrs. Lot <laughs> and think they're not. F the fear of Jezebel caused Elijah to forget that God never turns back. When, it, when Jezebel sent a message to Elisha, you've killed my prophets, but today you're mine. I'm coming for you today. He took off. And he ran, and he ran, and he ran until he collapsed under a juniper tree. But what did God do? God went after him and says, get back on the job. Get back on the job. You have job to, a job to do. You cannot afford to run. You cannot afford to go to the right nor to the left. You have to keep going ahead to do the things that I have called you and ordained you to do. Let's find out more about that in 1 Kings chapter 19. Reading from verse 14. And he, Elijah says to God, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant. They have thrown down thy altars Listen to who is doing this now. The children of Israel. The people that God has chosen. They have forsaken thy covenant. They have thrown down thy altars. And slain thy prophets with the sword. Isn't that something? They turn on the prophets that God sent to speak to them, to give them direction. They turn on them. So you see what is happening today is not new. It's old. You speak truth and people of God will turn on you. 
You try to get them on the right path and they'll despise you. They'll criticize you. They'll condemn you. When all you want to do is to get them to heaven. So it's not new. It happened then and it continues. He says, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. So, that's why I run. That's why I abandoned the call. That's why I aborted my purpose. Because look at what those people have done. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return to thy way, to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. See, God never turns back. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shephath, and Abel-Meholah, shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room or in thy place. Elisha was ready to give up the call. But God does not. You have work to do. Regardless of the conditions and the circumstances, you have work to do. I never turn back, and you better not turn back, because I have work to do. I have a kingdom to establish on the earth. And I have called you and chosen you to help advance the kingdom and the cause of the kingdom and the earth. So you cannot afford to turn back because I never turn back. I'm laying a foundation for the message. And it shall come to pass that at that, that at that escape it of the sword of his yell shall Jehu slay. Anyone who escaped the sword of his yell, Jehu will slay them. And him that escaped it from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. God has a mission to accomplish. Yet, God says, I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. God never leaves himself undone. If you abandon God, God will call somebody else. God will always preserve a remnant for himself to continue to go forward. Those who want to fall off, fall off. But I have a plan, and I am going to find who would avail themselves to be part of my plan. Having said that, let me move on. Every successive work of God becomes more and more glorious. God is always adding new dimensions to his work. Always. 
He's always making it more dynamic and more powerful. He never turns back. Therefore, he never uses the old way. God never uses the old way. If you decide to follow the stagnated Christian crowd, you are not ready to move forward with God. The Christian crowd has been for a long time on the way back to Egypt. Back to the world. And there they are, glorifying in the things that Jesus died to save them from. He took us out of the world. But for the past 50 years or so, the preachers, the preachers, have been taking the church back to Egypt. And like nobody was aware of that. Think about it. Think about the preaching that you've been hearing for the last 50 years. Look where it has brought the church. Faithless. Loveless, unforgiving, money mongers. And they brought the world into the church. When Jesus says, come out from among them. So the world is in the church. Satan has Christians in the church. And that's why God is scarce in the church. He never goes backwards. Naaman the leper did not know this about God. So he almost missed the opportunity to be cleansed of his leprosy. Let's go to 2 Kings. Chapter 5. Reading from verse 1. <clears throat> Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and an honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is in the land of Israel, and the king of Syria said, go to, go, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver and 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 changes of raiment. That's a hefty gift. 
that he is sending to the king of Israel because the maid says, if Naaman was in Israel, the man of God would recover him from his leprosy. And this general was important to the king of Syria because he could win battles for Syria. So the king wanted him well. So he was, didn't mind giving a nice gift to the king to make sure that the king would accommodate him. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel saying, now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, you see, he didn't understand because Syria wasn't his friend. The king of Syria wasn't his friend. They had just had war with Israel, and that's how the young maid from Israel ended up in Syria as Naaman, as, 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 the, as the, the, the king's wife's servant. So when he got this letter, he didn't understand. So he says, am I God to kill and to make alive? That this man that sent unto me to recover a man of his leprosy. Wherefore, consider, I pray thee, and see how he seeketh a quarrel with me. He said that was his aim. He's just trying a fast one to start another war with me. And it was so that Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes and that he sent to the king saying, wherefore the Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Don't be distressed, he's saying to the king of Syria. Send him unto me, and I will cleanse him of his leprosy. He'll know, in fact, that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horse and his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, go and wash in Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, he was angry, he was upset and went away. He went away in a rage. How dare the prophet tell me to go and wash in the river Jordan and I'll be cleansed. So Naaman was wrought, and he went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of his Lord, his God, and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. That's what he thought. That's what he heard happen to some other lepers, probably, or to some other sick people. So he expected God to do the same thing. So he was upset 
that God wasn't doing the same thing through his prophet. And this was his defense. He says, are not Abna and Papha rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. In other words, he's saying, look at the audacity of this prophet. If he wants me to go in a river and dip seven times to be clean, why would he send me to Jordan, that dirty river? When in Syria, we have rivers that are clean. Why not send me to Syria to a clean river? Rice send me to that dirty, muddy Jordan. And his servant came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather then when he said to thee, wash and be clean? Then he thought about it and he figured my servant may be right. Then he went, he down and dipped him seven times in Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Amen. Hallelujah. So I repeat, every successive work of God becomes more and more glorious. Naaman the leper didn't know this about God and he almost missed the opportunity to be cleansed from his leprosy. We have a situation with Elijah. You remember God told him to go back and anoint these people, and Elisha was one of them. So when Elisha decided to go on a journey, Elisha decided to go with him. So Elijah told him, I think you should go back. He says, no, I'm not going back. So Elisha followed him. He went to another place. Elijah, Elijah told him, go back. He said, I'm not going back. And that when he asked again to go back, Elijah told him, yes, it's okay. You could go back because you want to kiss your mother and your father goodbye. The Bible says when he went back, he took two of his oxen and he killed them. And he had a, a feast with his family and the community members. And the Bible says he took the, the yoke that he put on the oxen to plow the, the land. So he took the yoke and he made a fire from the yoke, killed the oxen, ate the food, and then he went to join Elijah. Let me tell you what happened in that account.
by killing the oxen, burning the yoke, he was saying, I am leaving that way of life behind. I'm never coming back to it. I'm on a new path now. I'm stepping into a new path with God. And in that new path, I have no need of the oxen. I have no need of the yoke to drive the oxen. So he was sure that he was never coming back because somehow he had a revelation that God keeps going forward all the time and he never looks back. That is one of the things that God admired with Elisha and made him the great prophet that he was. He was able to move when God was ready to move. Hallelujah. Because God never turns back. Jesus understood how progressive his father was and is. In Jesus' life and ministry, he was always progressive in spite of conditions and circumstances. His opposers and detractors could not distract him from his purpose. The religious leaders were after him to kill him all the time. But how many times did you see Jesus going to hide in? How many times did you see Jesus pausing because they wanted to kill him? Not once. That was not the nature of his father. And as the son of the father, that was not in his nature to turn back either. So each time God moves forward, something of his glory is revealed that has never been seen before. Mm. When God shows up in his next move on the earth, it would be more glorious than before. God will do things in his next move that he never did before. He will show himself greater and more powerful than in the past. Let me give you three principles for God's work. One, God always moves forward. Would you remember that? Show me a time when he didn't. You can't find it in his word. Principle number two, the latter glory is gonna be greater than the glory of former times. And principle number three, a new work lies ahead. A new work lies ahead. Oftentimes, God would close one door to open another door, a better door. Sometimes God will close out one phase to usher in another phase, a greater phase. We should have new experiences every day. As Christians, we should have new experiences every day. If our life is not renewed day by day, as the scriptures has encouraged us to, then we have a problem. We are stagnated. And when we are stagnated, we have to hold on to the old. 
we have to talk about what God did, not about what God is doing. Because all we have is the old. So that's all we could talk about. In the same way, if nothing new happens in the church of Jesus Christ, that church has stopped living by God's new life. God doesn't want all things in a new work of God. When God sent me to Trinidad to start ministry, it was a new work. I didn't seek out Christians to come to be part of the work. I didn't go to churches and try to see where the weak ones were to invite them to my church. I went into the devil's territory and I brought people out from Satan's grip because it was a new work. Stealing sheep is not progressive. I remember there was, we had a joint service at Queen's Hall. I initiated that joint service to try to bring the key ministers together because they were talking about me. He's not part of us, so he doesn't qualify. We can't allow him to, to thrive so I called them. I said, let's have a joint service in Queen's Hall. My congregation and your congregation, and we went to Queen's Hall, and we had a service there. I think it was three nights, three days, I think. Reverend Turner Nelson, he preached one night. Reverend Baird preached one, it was a day, and I did one so that we'll have a corporate service together. I thought that was a good thing to do, to bring the churches together. That was a start. And at the end of that series of messages, backstage, people were mingling and so forth, and I heard Reverend Baird telling Miriam, is Miriam here? She's, she's abroad. Yes. Oh, I thought she um, went back. <laughs> okay. He's telling Miriam she, he should, she should come to his church. I walked past us. I didn't want them to know that I hear because I felt so badly for him. We come to promote unity. And you, they're trying to win a sheep to come to your church. Sheep stealing is for hirelings. <laughs> so everything that happened in TCC was brand new. It was a new work, new impetus, new drive, new anointings. Hallelujah. Did not copy from anybody. I was not a carbon copy of anybody. 
I was an original. Because God had raised me up, invested in me, and commissioned me to do here what had not been done before. So it was a new work. Some present day denominations were formed out of a present move of God. As a result of that move of God, they felt that they were the chosen one to finally discover God and his power. God called us. God anoint us to advance his work. And rather than be humble and allow God to work in them and use them as he wants to do, they decided to put a claim on God and to make God theirs. So to ensure that they hold on to God and make him theirs, they, deno they denominationalize God. And they put a name to God and they put signs up. And when God is ready to move ahead, they are not ready nor are they conditioned to move ahead with God. So God has to look for a new wineskin. In the meantime, while God is looking for this new wineskin, the denomination begins to wither. Apostle, why do you think this is so? Because Jesus says, he told us that old wineskin cannot contain new wine. When I was a young Christian, I would turn on the radio to listen to messages. And there were Pentecostal ministers delivering the word of God. Don't you remember? They were delivering the word of God. There was a Pentecostal organization called, uh, was one of the big famous one, Assemblies of God, not Assemblies of God. No, 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 the international, not, not local. Uh, it was a common name because they were on, the, on fire for God. That organization, they were raising up churches everywhere and they were preaching the word of God. There were healings and there were miracles, salvation taking place. I think it was Assemblies of God, something like that. But a few, two years ago, one of those churches in Toronto, Canada, the pastor forbid the people to speak in tongues. When they were the ones that brought it to the forefront and introduced it to the Western world. But now, they forbid the people in that congregation to ever speak in tongues in that church. These days you don't hear anything much about Pentecostal church. And we'll understand why in a little while as I continue. You see, new wine 
can only be contained in new wine skin. Then the wine is poured out for men to drink. But when all the wine is drunk and there is no more wine left, the old wine skin remains. So whereas at one time, the Pentecostal was a new wine skin, God poured wine into them. But you see, that wine is not to stay in the wine skin. It's for men to drink. And men have drunk. And the wine ran out. And God wanted to move to another phase. And so God wanted a new wine skin because he had new wine. And he cannot put it in the old wine skin. And that is what has happened to that great Pentecostal movement. When God was ready to move forward, they were not ready to move forward with God because they had claimed him as theirs and they had labeled him as theirs. And if you didn't hear, listen to them, then you were wrong and you were off because God belonged to them. And there were others before the Pentecostal that did the same thing. There were many, many organizations that God had raised up, poured new wine in them, and the people drank from that wine. But when it ran out, they did the same thing. They felt that God had to stay with them. God could not afford to move beyond them, so they decided they're not moving because they had conquered God and he's now ours. And the, 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 the wine was used up, but they became old wineskins. And God had new wine and he had to look for new wineskins to put his new wine in. In every age, God always uses a certain group of people. Those people are the wine skin, and the Holy Spirit is contained in them. God is the wine. The people are the wine skin. But after a number of years, for one reason or another, God ceases to pour out his grace through the same people. Yet that group of people is still there. It is at this point that God, that this particular group, group of people have become old wineskins. But don't weep. Don't despair. God is at that very moment searching for a new people. He must have a new people. He must have a new wineskin. He is moving forward. And when God wants to move forward, his wine must be new and stronger and more abundant than before. If this newer, stronger wine were put in old wineskin, the old wineskin would not be able to contain it and it will break. And both the wine and the wineskin would be lost. Therefore, for God's work in every age, he longs for and searches to find a new wineskin. And when he finds a new wineskin, he will put new wine in it. Trinidad Christian Center started 
a new wine skin, a new wine was poured into it. In those days, every unsaved person that came to the service got saved. God is hearing me. Every unsaved person that came to every service in those days when I made the altar call, they wept their way into the kingdom. <laughs> many times, many times, I never finished my message. I would say the Lord is ready to save and people will run to the altar, fall down and weep themselves into the kingdom. It was new wine. Many times I couldn't finish my message. I'd say, Jesus is ready to heal. And the healing spirit will flow through the place and healings will take place spontaneously in the tent. That's why people remember the tent so, so much. When they step under the tent, the tent disappeared. It was a cathedral where the presence of God was. Because God was pouring out new wine. But after five years, when the new wine was poured out and people drank from God in that new wine, the wine skin remained. But God's will is that Trinidad Christian Center would become a new wine skin to receive the new wine for the next move of God. I cry because I'm emotional about these things. I weep because I know what God wants to do. I know what God wants to do. And if we decide to remain an old wineskin, God will have to look for somebody else because he has new wine to, to pour out to the world. And he must find a new wineskin to do it. He's not going to pour out new wine in old wineskins because it will break and it will be lost. Will we allow the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit to make us into a new wineskin? That's the question today. What I've been teaching since I came back is to make us into new wineskins. Every message. Every message is to make us into new wineskins for the new wine that God has for us. We have men like Job to learn from. We have Jesus to learn from. We have the Holy Spirit to teach us as he takes us through the crucible of pain and perplexity for promotion. It's not in vain. It's for promotion. 
So understand what God is doing in your life. And when you understand what God is doing, what God is wanting from you, you can respond to God and let God accomplish what he wants to accomplish in you, as painful as it might be, as confusing as it might be. Because at the end of that, if you allow God to do what he has to do, he'll promote you. You'll be part of this new move of God that God wants to do any time now. Not in the future. The moment God finds a new wineskin, he will pour his new wine into it. He's not going to wait for a year or two or three or four or five. The minute God finds a people that will allow God to make them into this new wine skin, God will pour his new wine into that people. And we don't want God to pass us by. No, no, no. He, we were a new wineskin when we started. He wants to make us a new wineskin again. So we could learn from Jesus. We could learn from the word of God. We could learn from the truth that God has given to us. Don't fight it. Don't oppose it. You'll be left out. In this new move... In this new move, I'll tell you what will happen. You say, how could you tell us and it didn't happen yet? In this new move, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God. All that you see happening now, don't despair. Don't be blind. Don't be distracted. God is not a loser. So in spite of all that you see happening, when God makes his next move, everything will crumble and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. All God is waiting for is the new wineskin to be ready. But guess what? I believe that I will be alive to see this new wine poured into the new wine skin. Oh, we give him praise. Hallelujah. Do not be sidetracked by what you see the, Satan and his agents doing in the world and in the church of Jesus Christ. I'm zealous for God. I should have retired a long time ago. (laughs) 
Sometimes I feel like it. There are many young ones to step forward and take my place. But I can't. Because where are they? See, God's work has to go on. And I have to go on until I see that God has found or made a new white skin for him to pour this new wine into. And at that time, I could sit back and say, do this, do that, do this, don't do that, and enjoy the benefits. I'll just drink from the wine. I'll just drink. Jennifer, come again. God gave you a dose last week. He wants to give you another dose. Oh, we give him praise. I don't know if you know it, but there's anointing in this place to cut through iron and steel. Hallelujah. you want the new wine? <laughs> mm. Mm. Be still and know that I am God. Quick, quickly. Just, just the, 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 the music for now.
congregation. You heard the message. Do you want to be part of the new wineskin that God is looking for? Precious Lord, precious Jesus, the people are hungry for more wine. And you are the wine. Pour into them right now, Lord Jesus. Pour yourself into them right now, Lord Jesus. Right where they are, right where they are. Receive right now. Receive Jesus. Receive the Father. <coughs> Receive the Holy Spirit right now in Jesus' name. Receive, receive, receive. He's here. He's here. He is here. Receive him. Receive him. Yes, receive him all over this place. Jesus. Oh, all over this place. God is pouring new wine right now. He's pouring new wine right now all over this place.
yourself. to 
to exhort on what is happening at this moment. We'll start with Reverend Martinez. Be free. This part of the service, God is not finished. I'm just following him. a burden on our hearts for the souls of men so that such as we have we could give we could only give what we have Amen He wants us to walk with Him in us so that as he passes by, all will receive. He says, such as I have, give I thee. And that's why he has come to equip each of us to give what we have. Because the world needs us. Amen. A dying world needs us. He wants to remind us that hell is real. And that people are slipping into hell every day. And we are not aware, we don't believe. But all he wants us to believe that hell is real. And he has called us, us, to awaken this world, to open their eyes, and to draw them to himself. Amen. 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 Praise God, Reverend Sud has come. It's part of the service. This world has nothing to offer. And if we can give him our all, and to surrender everything, to yield ourselves wholly to him, to love him with all our hearts, all our minds, all our soul, and all our strength. He will pour. He will pour. He will pour in. Because he wants to pour out. And we are his, we are his vessels. Oh God, surrender all to him. Leave nothing behind. The disciples left all and followed, and so much we. in him Lord Jesus yes flow through him throughout his body throughout his soul and his spirit be free now in Jesus name be free be free be free in Jesus name all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord.
saved this morning just wave your hand if you want to be saved if you don't know what that means it means that you want to give your heart to Jesus Christ that he will become your savior and your Lord that will bring you into that new creation that I spoke about any backslider that wants to come back to Jesus, come to the altar if that's you. Don't wait until Jesus leaves. Because if he's calling you now, come now. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. He's calling for you and he's calling for me. Calling for you and for me. to the Son except the Father draw him. And so it's the Father that's drawing you right now to come to his Son. And if you would open your heart and receive him, that is what it is. Open your heart. Open your heart and say this prayer from your heart not just your mind or your lips but from your heart Jesus will receive you he'll take away your sins and he'll give you a new spirit not born of the flesh nor the will of man but of God Say it from your heart, dear Lord Jesus. I once loved you. And I know you never stopped loving me. But I have allowed issues. The issues of life. To take your place. But today I heard a message. That challenged me. I felt, Lord Jesus, that I must come back to you because you have no pleasure in those that turn back. I repent. I'm sorry. I did not understand, but today I understand. And I come back 
with my whole heart, with my mind, with my soul, and with my body. I surrender it to you. By faith, I receive you now into my heart. I want you to live inside of me. Be my savior. Be my Lord. Give me a hunger for truth and the desire to be intimate with you. Thank you for helping me. I'm yours from this moment on. Amen. Thank you, my gracious Lord. Thank you for your goodness. You've been so patient. You've been so patient, Lord. You've come after us. And today you reached out with a greater intensity through your word. And here we are, surrendered to you. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we welcome them back into the kingdom of God. We welcome them back into the kingdom of God. Be faithful. Be faithful. Because he's faithful. And he'll give you the things that you need to prosper and be in health and to be successful. Yeah. It's a new day. It's a new day. Who can you trust today? There's no one you can trust today but Jesus Christ. You can't even trust yourself. Our hearts deceive us. Once you make Jesus Christ your savior, he doesn't only save you from sin, but calamities, accidents, sickness, disease, everything. He's beautiful. He's wonderful.
refresh today? Do you feel as though you've been washed in the blood of Jesus? Cleansed like Naaman the leper. He did it then for Naaman, today he did it for us. He's wonderful. Stay with him. Give him first place in your life. Not second or third or fourth, but first place. You may go back to your seat. become that new wine skin 
suddenly Jesus will show up. I know how to get there. I've been there and I could lead you there. Just come with me. Opposing me and fighting me wouldn't work. You'll harm yourself because God has a time. He's given us time to come in. When that time comes, if we still find favor in his sight, he's gonna come. And those who are in his way, he'll move them out of his way. When the fullness of time has come, you can't stop God. Can't stop him. You may be seated.